יותר טוב. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا على الصلاة حيا على الصلاة حيا على الفلاح حيا على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء فاتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد عبادة بن صامت رضي الله عنه narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said خمس صلوات كتبهن الله على العباد في اليوم في 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 اليوم والليلة. that Allah سبحانه وتعالى as ordained as made obligated five prayers upon the servants during the night and day. فمن حافظ عليهن كان له عهد عند الله أن يدخل الجنة فمن حافظ عليهن the one who protects it who maintains it for that person he has a promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he shall enter Jannah for the one who sticks to the five daily obligatory prayers that person has a promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he shall enter Jannah. As for the one who does not protect his salah, who does not maintain his salah, then he has no such promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu said, if Allah wills, he shall punish this person. Or if Allah wills, he shall forgive this person. The act of salah is well known in, in Islam. 
The importance of praying is well known in our daily lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times would emphasize the act of maintaining the salah. And the Prophet وسلم, that we, you would see from the beginning until his death, he would emphasize the importance of salah. But the khutbah is not about the importance of salah because we all know its rank. The khutbah today is to go over some of the mistakes we make when preparing for salah. Because you see Ramadan might have gone. But we are not only Muslims during the month of Ramadan. We are Muslims the whole year. And the Quran will not leave us. And the Sunnah will not leave us. And it is upon us to maintain what we learned and did during the month of Ramadan. But before I go over some of the mistakes we do during Salah, I need to go over what are my sources. From where am I getting my source? My source will be from a book that is called Al-Umda. Al-Umda. Which, which translates as something that is a foothold. And it is written by Sheikh Ibn Al-Qudama, Al-Maqdasi. And it follows the Hanbali Madhab. Now Sheikh Ibn Al-Qudama, he is the most well-known scholar of the Hanbali Madhab after Imam Ahmad himself. He was the one who came and purified the Madhab. And the reason why I am choosing this book mainly is because I am most familiar with the Hanbali Madhab. And also because the chapter of Salah, the book of Salah, the rulings pertaining to Salah, it's a comprehensive one. And the fiqh related to Salah is usually the longest chapter in all of the books. So for me to go over each of the madhab is time consuming. And also it is not beneficial for us regular Muslims because we just want to know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what the scholars have done through their expertise and knowledge is they have looked at the Quran and the Sunnah and from their experience they have extrapolated laws from the Quran and Sunnah. Because not everything is straightforward in the Quran and Sunnah. You can't find one verse in the Quran that talks about all of the shurut of Salah, for example. All of the preconditions of Salah. Or one hadith that explains all of the shurut of Salah. But what the scholars have done is they have compiled and gathered and made it easy for us. So this book Al-Umda is an introductory book for, for the lay Muslims. So for anyone who wants to learn their religion, it is an introductory book for us that Shaykh Ibn Al-Qudama wrote. And while the views I am talking about are of the humbly madhab, that does not mean I'm dismissing the, all the other madhab. Nor am I saying that the madhab that I'm following is correct. As Imam Ashafi he said, he said that while I know or while I want uh, my opinion to be right, I do not concede that the opinion of my opponent to be wrong. So, that's why I will go over this book during, the, uh, during this khutbah. I won't cover the whole book because that's impossible. I'm just going to go over some of the shurut of salah, some of the preconditions of salah. How do you prepare for salah? And Ibn Qudama, Shaykh Ibn Qudama, first he starts off by saying that a salah is obligatory upon every Muslim. Every Muslim is obligated to pray. Every Muslim that has reached the age of maturity, the age of puberty, 
This is important because the appearance. For children who has not reached the age of puberty, if the parent has not teached the children how to pray before the age of puberty, then in the eyes of the Sharia, ah, the parent is sinful, but the child is sinless. And this is only in the act of salah. No other act has this precondition. For example, a child can go up, grow up to be, and, and he, cannot, he, he can reach the age of puberty. But he will not fast until the, he reaches the age of puberty. And that's fine. But when it comes for salah, if the parent has not taught their children how to pray, then in the eyes of the Sharia, ah, the parent is considered to be sinful. So salah is obligated upon every Muslim that has reached the age of puberty and also that, are, that, that those that are, that are mentally sane, that are mentally conscious. <coughs> so for example, if you are sick and you lose consciousness, salah is not obligated upon you. For the one who is born with a medical defect, salah is not obligated upon you. So salah is obligated upon every Muslim that has reached the age of puberty and is mentally sane. Then he goes over the, the shurut of salah, the preconditions of salah. What do you need to do to make your salah valid before you come to salah? And the first precondition is that the, the first precondition is to be pure from hadith, spiritual purity. Spiritual purity. And you do that by making wudu or ghusl or if there is no water or if you, if you, if you cannot use water, tayammum. Brothers and sisters, you see shaitan has a trick that he engages you in acts that are halal but he makes you waste time doing those acts. And one of the mistakes we do when we get ready for salah is either we waste too much water or we spend too much time in the bathroom. We waste too much water or we spend too much time in the bathroom. The Prophet wasallam, he once came across a sahaba and this sahaba was making wudu next to a stream. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, Ya Gulam, what is this extravagance? What is this extravagance? And the Sahaba said, Is there extravagance even in wudu? And the Prophet ﷺ, Yes. There is extravagance even in wudu. There is wastefulness even in wudu. Allah SWT says in the Quran, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Eat and drink and do not be wasteful. Do not be wasteful. إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ Those who are wasteful, they are bedroom of the shayateen. They are considered to be companions of the devils. So shaytan makes you engaged in halal acts but makes you waste time in those acts. In this case, either water or spending too much time in the bathroom. Also, for our sisters, for those who use nail polish and lipstick, if the nail polish creates a barrier such that water does not touch your skin, then your wudu becomes invalid. Because one of the conditions of wudu is that water should touch the skin. Water should touch all parts of the skin that is for the wudu. But if the nail polish and lipstick prevents water touching the skin, then your wudu is invalid. And as a result, you should remove the nail polish and lipstick before making wudu. Also, when you wash your hands, washing 
the hand from the until the wrist is part of washing the hands and washing behind the elbows is part of washing the hands this the act of washing the hands at the beginning and the act of washing the hands at the later stage those are two separate acts so when you wash your hands you should include from the tips of the finger all the way to the elbow and to the back of the elbow as well sometimes we focus only on the on the top part of the elbow no this is wrong that we should focus on from the tip of the finger all the way to the elbow to the back of the elbow if you we do, do if we do that then your wudu becomes valid also when we wash our feet if we are washing our feet with our socks then we should wash all the way to the ankles because allah subhanahu said explicitly in the quran wa arjulakum ila al ka'bayn that wash your feet until the ankles to the ankles if you do not wash your ankles while washing your feet then your wudu is not accepted and why is this so important because you see al wudu or al tahara this is unanimous consensus from the scholars every scholar agreed upon this rule every scholar agreed upon this condition and when you have unanimous consensus some scholars say this is stronger than the quran and sunnah why because a, a verse could be interpreted differently a hadith the language could be seen differently for every scholar to come and look at the same quran and look at the same hadith and to come to the same conclusion this is why it is more it is a stronger evidence than the quran and sunnah itself so making wudu being careful with your wudu making sure every part is covered with your wudu this is very important for your salah to be accepted so the first condition for your salah to be accepted is at tahara min al hadith and you do that by wudu a ghusl a tayammum the second condition is that you pray the salah in its time you pray the salah in its time a man came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and asked ya rasulullah which deed is the most beloved deed which deed is the most beloved deed to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he replied prayer done on time prayer done on time and we all know the famous verse in the quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said inna as-salata kanat 'ala al-mu'minin kitaban mawquta that indeed salah there is a fixed time for the mu'min so we pray salah on time the earlier the better and the more reward you get but there is an exception which is for salatul isha salatul isha we delay it it is better to delay salatul isha but even this exception has an exception if delaying salah causes you to miss the jamaah then it is better to pray the jamaah than delaying the salah so if for example aisha is 9:15 it is better for you to come to the masjid and pray aisha at 9:15 but if you are at home and you know you're not going to come for to the masjid you you have you may have guests or you have work to do then it is better for you to delay salat aisha the third condition for your salah to be accepted is to cover your aura to cover your aura now the aura for the man outside of salah is from the navel to the knee we all know that but you see the aura for the man in salah is different it is the navel to the knee and at least one of your shoulders at least one of your shoulders the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he was talking to jabir ibn abdullah and jabir had a cloth on him he said if you have a cloth that is big enough then cover your shoulders 
cover your body. And if you are not able to, then cover your waist. You see the context is that in those times, people did not have or could not afford two pieces of cloth. They would have just one cloth covering that what we have the izhar for, we have for Umrah. But alhamdulillah now, there is no excuse. We have that luxury that we are able to cover our whole body. So, we cover our shoulders when we pray salah. Also, covering the aura means that you cover in clothes that are loose and not see-through. Because covering the aura is not what is, con- what is covered from the inside. It's what is seen from the outside. So if I'm able to see your body, even though you, 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 you cover in clothes that are, that, are, that are tight, that is not considered to be covering the aura. Brothers, please be careful. I'm talking to the brothers now. Make sure that if you're wearing shorts, that the short cover your knees, especially when you go for ruku and sujood. Or you wear shirt that are that are below the navel. Because there are some brothers when they go for sajda, their back becomes exposed. If at any point during the salah your aura becomes exposed, your salah is not considered to be complete. Your salah is not considered to be complete. Covering the aura is of the preconditions of salah. As for the sisters, Ibn al-Qudama in his book he wrote that everything is aura for the sisters except for the face and the hands. Except for the face and the hands. Which means the feet is part of aura. Covering the feet is part of the aura. And this is the opinion of the majority of scholars. The majority of scholars said that feet is part of the aura. Yes, there is a minority of scholars that say that feet is not part of aura. But the majority said that feet should be covered during salah. Especially during salah. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that when a woman stands up for salah, she should cover her hair. And the scholars, they made that analogy that say, they said, if you cover your, your hair, that means you should be in proper attire. And that is including the feet. If your feet becomes exposed, or your ankle, because sometimes we wear, uh, our sisters, we wear trousers that do not reach the ankle. Or we have socks that do not reach the ankle. If they are exposed, then your salah becomes incomplete. Brothers and sisters, the reason why I wanted to go over these mistakes is because of the importance of salah. Because of the importance of salah. And because of the rewarded rewards associated with salah. The first thing we will be asked when we are resurrected on the Day of Judgment is salah. Is salah. And if your salah is good, all your other deeds will be good. And if your salah is not good, then we ask Allah to protect, to protect us. May Allah make us among those who maintain our salah and who protects our salah and who become muqimeen as salah. Rabbana atina aqulu qawli hadha wa sufa wa welcome fastafiruhu innahu huwa al ghafuru rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا ما كنا لنهدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد Very briefly I want to talk about the goal of attaining knowledge What is the goal of attaining knowledge? You see brothers and sisters Attaining knowledge is meant, is meant for us to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And it is not meant for us to wiggle our way through, to find loopholes, to criticize one another. What do I mean by this? You see, sometimes we use knowledge to our advantage. For example, 
we know for example we see the salah begin and we know that if we catch the imam in his rukur we know that we have caught the salah so some of our brothers would continue talking chit chat talk on the phone and this is wrong we do not use knowledge to take advantage of the acts of the obligatory acts we use knowledge to become closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowledge on the day of judgment will be a proof for you or a proof against you and how you use that knowledge is very important is very important so no use your knowledge wisely use your knowledge wisely use it to become closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use it to become people of ahlu dhikr use it to become people of ulul albab so use your knowledge wisely and bring it and make it so that you become closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who use knowledge wisely who who maintain the salah who keep within the rights of islam and who follow the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam اللهم اجعل اخر كلامنا من الدنيا شهاده ان لا اله الا الله وان محمد رسول الله وتوفنا وانت راض عنا غير غضبان ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب واقم الصلاه الله اكبر الله اكبر اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان محمدا رسول الله حي على الصلاه حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاه قد قامت الصلاه الله اكبر الله اكبر لا اله الا الله Let's try to finish the first row. Allahu Akbar. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين <تصفيق> والضحى والليل اذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى وللاخره خير لك من الاولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى الم يجدك يتيما فاوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فاغنى فاما اليتيم فلا تقهر واما السائل فلا تنهر واما بنعمه ربك فحدث الله اكبر سمع الله لمن حمده 
Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'bud Wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين والتين والزيتون وطور سينين وهذا الملد الأمين لقد خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم ثم رددناه أسفل سافلين إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فلهم أجر غير ممنون فما يكذبك بعد بالدين أليس الله بأحكم الحاكمين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله